All right, so welcome everyone. Um, my name's Georgia Mason. I'm director of the Campbell Center for the Study of Animal Welfare. And it's really wonderful today to have Dr. Jennifer Van Oss from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, Dr. Van Oss, she's an assistant professor in and extension specialist in animal welfare. And she specializes on dairy welfare, applying the science and integrating it with societal values. And she's particularly interested in promoting best practices in management. And she's going to talk to us today about some really creative schemes she's developed essentially to use video games to train people to move, cat, move cows in a better in a better way. Um, but obviously, um, I should um, add a land acknowledgement here. And as you all know, um, here in Guelph, we're based on the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, who are one of the Anishinaabex people. And Jen and I decided we'd do something um, unusual today in recognition that the Anishinaabek people have a treaty, the Dish With One Spoon Treaty, with the Haudenosaunee people, who are essentially the Six Nations. And so we agreed we'd kick off today by playing you the Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving Address. Now, this is three minutes long, and it's in the Mohawk language, which I'm going to be pretty sure most of you don't speak. So why are we playing it? Well, we're playing it for a couple of reasons. One is that it's a really important part of local Indigenous culture. It would be the traditional opening to, uh, to many meetings. Another is that it's just really beautiful. So although you won't understand it, I want you to listen to the repeated refrain, which you will pick up. And the repeated refrain is essentially, we are grateful for X. And you'll see that a number of different things are named. X gives us, and then imagine what you get from the thing that's just been named. We greet X and say, thank you. Now our minds are one. And that's the kind of recurrent refrain you're going to hear. So Jen's gonna play the video for you and then we'll begin with her presentation. If you have questions or comments as well, please pop them in the meeting chat if you're online. Otherwise we'll have questions at the end of the talk. Great. It took a dinner Dietina Wanado, Nayo Tunduni, Taito, Nayo Tohage, Nanagua Nigora. Dietina Wanado, Ne Ono Qua Suma, Taito Gari, Nayo Tohage, Nanagua Nigora. Dietina Wanado, Ne Asa Nigunda de Kohogua. Taito Gari, Nayo Tohage, Nanagua Nigora. Taitina Horado, a Wahyaniota. The eight to Garina Yotoge, and I got Nigora. Taitina Horado, Nekundirio. The eight to Garina Yotoge, and I got Nigora. Taitina Horado, Negarunda Sua. The eight to Garina Yotoge, and I got Nigora. Taitina Horado, Nezita Ogua. The eight to Garina Yotoge, and I got Nigora. Taitina Horado, Nagayedi, Nikawarage, Tae Togarina Yotohage, Nanagua Nigora Taitina Horado, Naiti Sotogo, Radiweras, Tae Togarina Yotohage, Nanagua Nigora Tatsidawano Horado, Naitsidawatia, and Jekene Garaqua Tae Togarina Yotohage, Nanagua Nigora Taitina Horado, Naiti Sota Asta Naka Garaqua Taito Gadinayo Tohage, Nanagua Nigora Taitina Horado, Naiozi Stoch Quadonio Taito Gadinayo Tohage, Nanagua Nigora Taitina Horado, Nadion Kiadadu Taito Gadinayo Tohage, Nanagua Nigora Tatsidawa no Horado, Nesunguaya Dizu Taito Gadinayo Tohage
Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Georgia, for the introduction and for choosing that beautiful video clip. I am sorry for pausing it in the middle. It happened accidentally when I read the chat, so I'm not going to read the chat again until the very end of this presentation. But again, I'm really happy to be here to share with you an exciting project that's been in the work for a few years. And I want to start by talking about the genesis of the idea for this project a little bit, and then I'll go into more detail later. But as Georgia mentioned, I'm an assistant professor, so I'm a faculty member and a researcher, but I'm also an extension specialist in animal welfare. So I'm not responsible for any courses here at UW-Madison. I do some guest lecturing, but I do my teaching, and I like to say I do my learning in the field as well. So I work with dairy farmers and everybody who I call their supporting advisors, whether that's their veterinarians, nutritionists, other types of consultants, trainers, everybody who supports them on the farm in their decision making about their housing, housing and management practices. So I started here at UW-Madison almost five years ago, which I can't believe it's been a bit of a time warp, as I'm sure many of you have experienced. But when I first moved here, I wasn't familiar with the Wisconsin dairy industry. And so I visited a lot of farms with some more experienced colleagues who had developed these relationships. I went to producer meetings and I just had a lot of conversations with dairy farm owners. And I asked them, first of all, what what does animal welfare mean to you so that we could get on the same page about this terminology? I think there was a lot of confusion and hesitation around that. But then once we got on the same page, we could talk about what were the challenges they faced with animal welfare and how could I help them with my research and extension program? So I was a little bit surprised that the most common request I got from farm owners was, could you please come to our dairy farm and train my employees on humane or appropriate how cow handling practices? And the reason this was surprising to me is because we have a lot of resources available in the industry. A lot of them are free and well-produced, but clearly something wasn't translating into practice on these farms. So that kind of got the wheels turning and that led to what I'm gonna talk about today. So just to review what has been documented in the literature, we know that appropriate cow handling is important from a lot of different perspectives, including animal welfare, and that proper using proper handling practices can reduce the risk of injuries to the people who work with cows and to the cows themselves. It can reduce cow stress levels, thereby improving their welfare. And also if you handle cows using correct practices, this can improve efficiency or throughput in the milking parlor and improve milk yield through a number of different mechanisms. And that also poor handling creates a risk of negative exposure for the industry. So by using appropriate practices, we can hopefully improve consumer confidence. So for all these reasons and more, in the U.S. dairy industry now, there is an explicit expectation. So the farm program is somewhat analogous to ProAction in Canada, and now 99% of dairy farms in the U.S. participate through their milk cooperatives or processors. So there's a set of of standards that's publicly accessible, and every farm is evaluated at least every three years or more frequently against these standards. So the current version is called Farm Version 4.0. It went into effect at the beginning of 2020, and it will continue until 2024 when version 5.0 will go into effect. So a new expectation in version four was that everybody on the farm with a cow handling role needs to have evidence of continuing education in animal handling. And so we use these terms interchangeably, training, continuing education, various terms like that. But essentially, they need to have some kind of refresher, or if you're a new employee, it needs to be training for the first time on these appropriate practices. And so this is just an example of a training record that a farm can download from the farm program's website. They don't have to use this. They can use some other form of documentation. But here I've highlighted where they can check off that they had some kind of continuing education in stockmanship, which is another way of saying animal handling. So what this training can comprise is completely open-ended at this time, but there must be some form of documentation so that if an evaluator comes to the farm, they can see that every employee who has an animal handling role has this continuing education in this topic. And before this point, there were some data from the United States Department of Agriculture showing that training specific to this topic has not been universal in the US 
dairy industry. So as of 2018, which was two years before that expectation went into effect, just over half of U.S. dairy farms reported providing training specific to this topic of moving or handling animals. And so other research has documented a number of barriers towards providing training in this topic. So dairy farm owners and managers have cited things such as a lack of time to pause and be able to provide this kind of training, a lack of resources. So they think that whatever is available out there either does is not is not appropriate for them or not relevant or, or insufficient in some way, or maybe they're just not aware of these resources. And then also language barriers has been a growing problem in a number of areas just due to demographic shifts in the composition of people who are working in these cow handling roles on farms, such as milkers, people who are commonly called cow pushers in the industry, which is terminology I'm trying to get away from because that implies we are pushing the animals forcefully from one area to the next. So I like to call them cow movers. And so you'll see this motif of moving cows. So there are a number of potential barriers. And in addition to these challenges, as I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, the principles for moving animals are quite well established. So this has been well documented for beef cattle and translated to dairy farm context. So I just have here a snippet of a diagram that I think many of us have seen that are in textbooks such as those by Dr. Temple Grandin, where we can work with the cow's natural behavior to move her without force. So what you're seeing illustrates what's called the flight zone, there's a blind spot, there's point of balance. These concepts are very well established. But despite that, clearly people are struggling to apply these concepts. I think that this is evident from dairy producers asking me to come to farms and try to train people on how to apply these concepts. We also see it in other settings such as classrooms. So with undergraduate students or veterinary students, they learn about the flight zone and these types of things in the classroom. But then when we put them in the barn, we see that somehow understanding this concept and being able to regurgitate it doesn't translate into skills when put into practice. So sort of related to this, um, there is no standard for what constitutes effective training. So with the farm program right now, it can be completely open-ended. You can have a conversation with a supervisor, read an article, watch a video, any of those can constitute training. And so one of the limitations is that there has been very limited research on, first of all, how training is being carried out across farms. We have some preliminary data here in Wisconsin that hasn't been published yet about the range of what people are actually doing. And there's also very little research on what constitutes effective training. So are the tools that are freely available right now improving knowledge? Are they improving behaviors? And so there's very little work in that area. So what I'm showing here is a framework for um, a project that I'm not going to talk about in as much detail today, <laughs> but this was funded by the US Department of Agriculture. I have collaborators across institutions, including in Canada and Australia, where we identified some limitations. So one that I just mentioned is that we lack evidence of effectiveness for the tools that are currently available. So that's what I'm mostly gonna talk about today. But another limitation we've identified is that a lot of tools that are available also lack understanding of the handler's attitudes. And so I'll talk about that just briefly a little bit later on. So first, I'm going to talk about this lack of evidence of effectiveness and why I think even without documentation of effectiveness, perhaps the resources that are available may not be effective. And, and hence this demand for, for innovative tools. So the first is that this is a trend that we've seen in classroom settings, not just when we're talking about cow handling, about any type of concept that people are trying to learn, is that engagement or interactiveness improves learning outcomes. And when we think about some of the resources that are freely available, these are what are called passive learning modalities. So if you watch a video or you read an article or a handout, you're passively taking in information. And that means that you aren't practicing skills or applying those concepts. And what the pedagogical literature has shown is that if you have some mechanism for learning by doing, that helps reinforce these concepts and um, helps with knowledge retention or putting these skills into practice. So in the classroom, we know about active learning techniques, which could be think, pair, share, where you discuss something with a partner or with a small group, and that by 
doing something active, such as discussing a concept rather than just listening or, or seeing something passively, it helps reinforce that learning. And so similarly, when we think about cow handling skills, if people take in these concepts about the flight zone, but don't have a chance to practice them, that's where this disconnect can happen. And even with in-person training, sometimes there's some limitations, which I'll touch upon. And so what we wanted to do was come up with a way to bridge this gap between learning about these concepts and then working with real cows so that people could learn by doing and practice. So I gave this away in the title of my talk, but what we've developed is a video game and we're calling it Moving Cows. So reinforcing the concept that we're trying to move cows from point A to point B, but we're not trying to push them. <laughs> we're trying to use these so-called low stress handling techniques to take advantage of an understanding of the cow's natural behavior. So what you're seeing here is a screen cap from the starting menu of the game. And so what I'm gonna talk through is why we think that this particular tool could be an innovative solution to these um, knowledge gaps or gaps in resource availability that I've described. So why a video game? There's this concept called serious games. Sometimes they're called educational games, but they're used in a lot of different contexts. And so sometimes they are video games. Other times they're, they come in other formats, but there is actually considerable research that has shown that this catch-all of serious games has produced positive learning outcomes compared to more traditional or passive learning modalities, such as in military or professional business training, as well as in educational classrooms of various ages, and also in the context of health behavior education, meaning teaching people such as you and me about behaviors relating to their health, such as safe medication use. And there is limited proof of concept within the agriculture sector that these games could potentially be useful in um, settings such as cow handling. So one particular inspiration is this idea of a flight simulator. And so what I'm showing here is that John Deere, which makes tractors, has equipment simulator software. And I happened to be at a trade show in Finland in early 2019, right after I got the idea for this game. It was just brewing in my head. But at the trade show, they had a setup where you could sit in a seat that was taken from a tractor. And in front, there was a large monitor. And behind you, there was a large monitor. And so you were in this flight simulator to practice driving this heavy machinery machinery. And so I was really happy to see this because it told me that perhaps, you know, this idea wasn't so crazy and that we could apply it to something like cow handling. And so just as an aside, my father-in-law is a retired commercial airline pilot. And towards the end of his career, he was learning to operate new aircraft. And even with all these decades of experience under his belt, they didn't let him just pilot or even co-pilot the real plane. He had to go through flight simulator training. And so this is widely practiced in aviation and other industries where it's dangerous, <laughs> expensive, and impractical to put people into these real life situations without practicing in a simulator. And I think of cow handling as roughly analogous to that, where if we put inexperienced people or people who use poor practices in a real life setting without simulating at first, there is this risk of injury to both people and animals, and we risk causing stress or poor welfare to real life cows. And so this is what excited me about this idea. So just a rough timeline. In 2018, I started in my position here. I talked with producers and they had identified this need for better training or learning tools relating to cow handling. And so in early 2019, I got the inspiration for this idea of a video game, which was then reinforced when I saw this trade show and I saw the John Deere tractor simulator. So I thought, okay, maybe, maybe there actually is the right technology and it's the right time for this kind of thing. So over the next two years, I started a assembling my academic collaborators across different disciplines. I began interviewing different professional developers that could help me design and program a game because I had no experience whatsoever with developing educational games. I'm not even, I don't identify as a gamer. I don't play a lot of video games. Um, and then we also applied for funding twice. We were unsuccessful the first time, but successful the second time. And so in this interim where I was applying for funding, we were able to sort of 
refine our ideas of, you know, what should this game focus on? And we were able to create some concept art with a mini project. And I think that that helped our reviewers really visualize what we were going for. So in our second round, we actually did receive funding. Um, and this was an internal grant here at UW-Madison. They call it the Research Forward Initiative. And it's for sort of high risk, potentially high impact activities, which I think that this would qualify as. So it took a while to get through some bureaucratic red tape to a, approve a very large dollar contract to develop this game. But um, we were very excited that about a year ago, we were able to develop a first working prototype, which we tested internally with some members of my lab. And then we had a second prototype that we took out and tested with various dairy industry stakeholders. That's what I'll talk about next. And so what was really important was that we obtained feedback from our potential end users or target audience. So for this first iteration of the game, we're really focusing on people who work on real commercial dairy farms, so milkers and cow movers, so that they could have this new tool to help them in their jobs, help improve animal welfare, hopefully, and also provide by documentation of continuing education in cow handling. I do foresee many other different types of audiences as well, and I'll talk about that at the end. So what we did was we engaged with various stakeholders in the Wisconsin dairy industry by holding focus groups. So this was with the second, what we're calling the alpha prototype of the game. And so it was a very limited prototype and it was deliberately rough at this stage. And so we took this out to these groups. We didn't want to get so far along in the development that their feedback could not be incorporated. Um, and so we, we took this rough prototype that just focused on one scenario where they were supposed to move lactating cows out of their freestall home pen in preparation for milking. So we started with this pilot group here on campus in part to sort of test out the timing and refine the questions that we were asking. So we're very fortunate here at UW-Madison, we have a group called RARC, and they are dedicated trainers who help researchers, whether those are PIs like me, graduate students, technicians, et cetera, um, to handle different types of animals. And they can teach procedures such as blood draws or milk collection and ruminal fluid collection, as well as just basic animal handling. So we have several trainers who specialize with cattle. You can also learn how to handle snakes <laughs> or whatever species you're working with. So they're a fantastic resource. So we worked with them first, and then we went out to these stakeholders in the sort of private industry. So on campus, we held three different focus groups in English, and this was a, with a total of 10 people. So some of them were local dairy farm owners, a few of them were bilingual English and Spanish professional consultants and trainers who work with farms in the surrounding region, and we also had consulting veterinarian. And then we also went to two local dairy farms, so the owners had participated in the on campus focus groups, but we wanted to work directly with people we considered to be our target audience. So on the two different farms, you can see this represents one farm, this represents another. We separated them by language of preference. And so we had groups held in Spanish, we had groups helped in, held in English, and we also separated them by role. So we wanted to make sure that supervisors and their direct reports weren't in the same focus groups to remove this pressure for respondents to respond in a certain way. And then we also had to separate them by shift on this farm. So there was a day shift and a night shift. And so we had these facilitated focus group discussions where they played the prototype of the game. And then we recorded these discussions where we asked them using certain prompts about their impressions of the game. So where did you encounter problems? Um, where did you not understand certain aspects of the game? Did they have ideas for improvement, et cetera? And so then what we did after these focus groups in August was I <laughs> went through all of the transcripts and I sort of informally coded the themes into these categories. So we didn't have time for a formal thematic analysis just to, due to the pace of the development because we were working with this um, professional company who specializes in educational games. But I came up with three broad categories. So the first was actionable feedback that we could incorporate into this version of the game. The second was ideas for a future version of the game. So this could be expansion into different cow handling scenarios. And then the third category was more users' reflections about their experiences working with cows in real life that were fascinating but couldn't necessarily be actionable into um, changes to the current game. 
And so we took all of this feedback, prioritized it as high, medium, low, and we were actually able to incorporate most of it into this third prototype that again, we tested internally. And then finally we released this first version of the game that we're calling 1.0. And so I say release, but I'll talk about in, in a little bit what we're actually going to be doing with this next. But for this first version of the game, we're thinking of it more as a proof of concept. So we wanted to see, can we even make a video game about cow handling that seems roughly relevant and feasible? And so we wanted to have a very narrow focus, but with a high degree of polish. And so as you'll see, I'll show you some video clips. We really wanted to stick to what I would call basic routine cow move movement. So taking cows out of their home pen in a freestall barn to towards the milking parlor. And then once they're in the marking, milking parlor, loading them into the stalls for milking. So we know that on a day-to-day -day basis on dairy farms across North America, there are a lot of other situations where you need to handle or move cows, but we wanted to start with this very narrow focus as a proof of concept. So when people play the game, these are the learning objectives. We hope that by playing, they will understand how their behavior as a human being affects how the cows respond to them. So both how the cows move away from them, this flight zone concept, but also when you take additional actions like using your voice or using physical touch, how does that change the cow's behavior? And also how do these actions affect cow stress levels? So we know from considerable research that there you can roughly categorize human behaviors as negative or positive and that negative actions will increase stress levels in the cow. So you, so you see this happening in the game. And then this increase in cow stress moderates milk production. So people get feedback on that by playing. And then also they get some feedback about how their actions can affect their own safety. So if they trigger responses in the cows that can lead to a dangerous situation, that's something that they learn about. So hopefully what you're seeing now is a little video clip of me playing the game. And so this is one of the milking parlor levels. And so what you're seeing illustrated here is a technique called walk back by, and it's specific to um, environments such as the milk parlor, where the cows are constrained to walking in one direction. So this also applies to when you're loading, say, beef cattle into a handling chute, or you want to walk counter to the direction of cow movement to keep them flowing in. So you're just using your body on the So that's one of the learning objectives of the milking parlor, is that you can use this walk back by technique you don't have to use your voice, you don't have to use this is just a preview of the And then as I mentioned, we also have a free salt pen. And so here what you're seeing is me moving a cow away from the seed bunk and then moving her towards the gate to the pen, which is in the lower right hand corner of the screen. And I'm showing you this because anecdotally, this is where I see a lot of learners struggle, whether it's on a dairy farm or in um, like a higher education setting where we teach students about the flight zone, but then they try to go move cows in a pen. I often see them standing directly behind the cow at the feed bunk and tap her on the rump and wonder, okay, why isn't she moving? And it's because you not allowed her a path to move into. And so in the game, you learn about this. There are tutorials, they start on the pasture level, and then we progress into the freestyle pen where you can learn about where to position your body to get the cows to move. So in the freestyle pen, we also have cows lying down in deep sand bedded stalls, and you learn about how to get them to stand up from the stalls and to exit them again without blocking their path. And then at the end, you'll see a little preview, which I'm going to talk about later, where another cow comes running in. But we have features in here that we tried to make it relevant or realistic, even though the art style is very cartoonish, where you can see there are water troughs, there are mechanical rotating brushes. We wanted to um, to make it relevant to people who work in free salt dairy barn. So coming back to why a video game, I mentioned earlier that this is a way that people can practice active rather than passive learning. So they're, they're doing something and learning by doing, but in this simulated 
um, environment. And in the simulated environment, as I alluded to with my anecdote about the flight simulator for pilots, is that you are in this controlled and safe environment. So there's no risk of you actually getting hurt or cow getting hurt or cows becoming stressed and having a fear response and learning from that fear and becoming harder to handle in the future. And so you can deliberately make mistakes and do things that you shouldn't do in real life so that you can learn from those things. So the game has scenarios where you are kind of forced to do something that you know is wrong, but that way you can see how that plays out and learn about the consequences. So related to that, you can experience situations that would be challenging to mimic in real life due to these various constraints such as cost, time, or safety. So if we think about in-person training, which is what dairy owners had been asking me to do, you know, come to the farm and demonstrate this, that is active learning. You're learning by doing, but you're limited to a narrow set of situations that you, you can't mimic that we can in a video game setting. So somewhat related to that, because it is a virtual environment, we can use visual augmentation to try to help convey some of these concepts that is hard to visualize or describe even in real life. And people do receive some limited immediate feedback. And I say limited, and I'll explain why later. So just as an example of visual augmentation, this is the very first level in the game. It's a pasture tutorial, so we're in a literal <laughs> open field, and there are just two cows. And so what it's showing is that different individual animals have different sized flight zones because some animals are more fearful than others. And so this cow has a smaller flight zone. You need to get closer to her before she moves. This cow has a larger flight zone because she's more fearful. So even while you're still further away, she'll respond by moving away from you. So this is just an example of how we can apply this visual augmentation that in real life is harder to see. And then what I'm going to show you here is just an example of immediate feedback. And so this is where you can see consequences of your actions. The cows are frightened. Your stress level and the cow's stress level went up. And so what you hopefully saw in this clip, this is the tutorial level. So this is our, our narrator, coworker character. Um, and so you yelled at the cow and you learned with this text, text and narration feedback that the cows were frightened. And then hopefully you saw this red arrow um, appear above the cow indicating her stress level increased. And then here on the left, actually, we have a cumulative stress meter, which shows how you're impacting all of the cows in the pen or in the herd. And so then you got some feedback about what happened here. And so that's just one example of immediate feedback. Yeah. Sorry. And um, what you're seeing here is an example Jennifer, of a situation. Sorry to interrupt. I was just wondering if you could turn the volume down in the video game. We can't quite hear you over it. Hold on. I'm, I'm trying to pause here. Thank you. OK, how about now? That's perfect. Thank okay. you. Okay. I think that there's actually only on or off. <laughs> so I've turned off the sound. So as you can hear, there's sound effects. And I think there's no more um, game and voiceover narration that I want you to hear. So I previewed this earlier, but I had been moving a cow out of this stall. And now I'm getting ready to move these two cows further towards the gate. But what you can see happening... Um, hopefully is right here. <laughs> this cow kind of comes out of nowhere. So this is, this is the cow I'm working with, but then you can see this one come up over here. And so this is illustrating a cow in estrus or in heat. And we know from real life that when cows are in heat, they often are moving a lot around the pen. They're trying to mount other cows and that this can be very dangerous for people. And so this is what I mean of an example of a real life situation that can be challenging to mimic even in in-person training where it, it can be dangerous to try to navigate this or you're not guaranteed to find a cow in heat on the day of training. So in the video game, and we can incorporate these types of scenarios. And so earlier I mentioned instantaneous feedback, but we also have different sort of more delayed feedback. So at the end of each level, and there are eight levels, you get this sort of summary of what happened. So you have cumulative cow stress. So how did your actions affect all of the cows in the pen or in the pasture? And then we learn about how that affects milk yield. And so you can see this 
person did pretty well in this level, cow stress was low, it was in the green zone, and milk production was pretty high relative to the maximal potential. And so you get this gold star saying, okay, you did it because you exceeded this um, sort of threshold of reasonable levels of cow stress or reasonable handling. And so this comes back to these learning objectives of understanding how your behavior affects the cow's responses, including their stress and their production. And then at the very end of the game, if you pass all of the levels, so actually I should say, if you don't pass a level, you get a chance to start over and, and try that level again. So at the very end, you earn this certificate of completion. And this is something that is saved automatically on a mobile tablet, and it can be offloaded and printed. So if you have a binder that you're using to document training, or if you just have a folder on the computer where the supervisor or manager is saving this documentation, they have this certificate that has the date, the person's name, there's a space where the supervisor can manually add their signature if they choose. And this could serve as documentation for the farm program for this ex expectation of annual continuing education. So one thing to note is that in the beginning, I mentioned that language barrier is um, something that dairy owners have cited as to why they have trouble providing this continuing education or training. And so this is something that we were considering when we were designing the game. And we know that accessibility is incredibly important and that language is one dimension of accessibility. So our end users, when we think about the dairy industry, especially in Wisconsin and, and elsewhere, I'm sure has similar demographic shifts that we need to think about linguistic appropriateness. So the overall language that the game is in, but also the terminology used, does it resonate with those end users? We also need to consider cultural relevance since we have people coming from a lot of different regions with different levels of experience. And there's also this variation in literacy levels that kind of uh, is correlated with these other factors. So some people are highly literate, some people have limited formal educational attainment and limited literacy. And so with that in mind, we design the game so that it is available fully in both English and Spanish. And I have heard requests for other languages as well, reflecting the demographics of our dairy workforce here in the US. And so what you're seeing is an example screenshot of the game in Spanish, where all of the text that appears on the screen and all of the voiceover narration is available in Spanish or English. And, and a user can actually pause the game and toggle to a different language if they decide. But not only is it available in two languages, but we also really wanted to minimize the amount of written text. So you saw an example of where there is tutorial text, there's voiceover narration, but we wanted to limit the amount of text that people encountered because of this variability in literacy levels that on average can be low for this target demographic. So then every, every piece of text that appears on the screen also has a voiceover narration. And then we also provided this choice of six avatars. So at the start of the game, you can choose which character you want to play as. And this is based on some limited research that shows that when people are able to better visualize themselves in that role or identify with the character in the game, that this um, can promote this identification or maybe ability for them to relate to this and, and translate it to their real life experience. So I'm just showing you this choice. We had actually talked about further customization. So originally, we would let people choose their hairstyle, their hair color, facial hair, <laughs> skin tones, this sort of thing. Um, but that just became too cost prohibitive. And so instead, we started with six preset characters that we did get feedback from our pilot test groups on. And then I, I do have um, data when people play the game, I'm able to see which characters they select. So if we find that one of the characters is very unpopular, we might consider replacing that. And so that is kind of a preview of the next step, which is that we have further feedback with end users plan. So last August, we got this feedback on the alpha prototype of the game. We refined this and now we have this version 1.0 of the game. But even though I say that it's been released, it's not available in an app store. It's not publicly available because we do still plan to do some user feedback and try to improve it to version two of the game. So this spring, we are beginning recruitment actually in a couple of weeks to do an additional round of testing and user feedback on this version one of the game. And so initially, we are going to go to three farms that we did not visit last year because we want to do some preliminary 
assessment of improvement in knowledge before and after people play the game. So I just have 10 multiple choice questions about best practices for cow handling skills that they'll answer and they can choose if they're not sure. Actually, we, we predict that maybe they'll be uncertain about the answer and we want them to not guess. We want them to actually choose an answer and they can say if they're unsure. And then after they play the game, we predict there will be fewer unsure responses and more correct responses. And then we also want to go to the two farms that we went to before. And if there are people who are still working there, we would like them to provide their feedback now on the full version of the game. We know that they were invested and that we want to show them what came of the feedback they gave us. But we want to solicit feedback from these new um, players as well well. So we want to see with this full version of the game, are there ways that we can further improve it? Are there sticking points or things that are unclear that people got confused about? Are there ways that we can improve the relevance? So that's what we have planned this spring. And so then hopefully this fall, depending on <laughs> how much it costs, we would like to iterate to a version two of the game because I'm envisioning in the future that we can combine it with another tool that I kind of mentioned earlier in this presentation. And so I'll talk about that just really briefly. So in the coming years, we would like to do a more rigorous sort of randomized controlled field trial to see how effective these combined learning tools are, not just for improving knowledge, but for actually improving human behavior and whether that then translates into changes in how the cows respond to people. So that kind of goes back to this original framework I showed you, where we had identified several limitations with current resources that are on the market. So first is we don't have evidence of effectiveness, so we want to test that, but also this lack of understanding of handlers attitudes. And so this is where this ProHand tool comes in that comes from a lot of foundational research out of the University of Melbourne in Australia. So this is this group with Graham Coleman, Paul Hemsworth, Lauren Hemsworth, um, Jeremy Skews. And so this is sort of our overall hypothesis driven approach where we think that these learning tools about cow handling need to target both the handlers' attitudes and their behaviors, because this work from Melbourne had shown that people's attitudes affect their behaviors towards animals, such as dairy cattle and pigs. And at the same time, it's important that we do this public engagement. So this includes stakeholders within the dairy industry, as well as general public, so potential consumers, voters, anybody who might have a stake in cow handling, even if they don't work on the farm or in the industry, and that we need to integrate the values of this variety of stakeholders in, into designing this tool. And that hopefully by doing all of this, we can improve cow handling practices on farm and thereby improve animal welfare and hopefully build public trust in our dairy farming practices and promote the social sustainability of the dairy industry. Oops. Okay. And so, so I see <laughs> a lot of things kind of with the future of this tool, um, but I'm not sure exactly about the timeline because it, this will depend on being able to apply for some funding. And so I would like to do more research on the tool as I outlined earlier. Um, and I think that part of that would include testing it with additional audiences. So I am building a spreadsheet of potential collaborators. I already have about a dozen people in the US and Canada who are interested in testing this. Um, not just on dairy farms, but also in higher education classrooms or with veterinary students. Um, and, and so I think that we could also expand into a version three, so not just the version two with my end user feedback in the coming year, but into these future versions. Um, I would also like to distribute this to the dairy industry. I would love for this to be freely available to farms. Maybe if people in the general public want to play it, they can, but would have to pay, but I'd really like this to be free for farms. So I'm not sure when this public release will happen, whether this will happen before testing it with these different audiences or after. Um, but I do also see potential for expansion. So right now we have this very narrow scope where we're using it in um, just these routine cow handling situations, but maybe we can add additional layers of challenge. So when we had done our initial pilot testing in August, a lot of people who work on farms identified the maternity pen as a pinch point where they felt like that was a very challenging situation, moving animals within this, this calving pen context, or it could be loading a hoof trimming chute or loading a trailer, that kind of thing. So we see a lot of potential for expansion and I'm very open to ideas. And so if you are interested, this is my email address. 
And I encourage you, in addition to asking questions today, to reach out to me. Let me know if you want to be on my list of potential collaborators, if we are going to apply for additional funding. Um, and so in closing, I just want to thank everybody who's supported this project, either in terms of giving feedback or in terms of funding. Um, it's It's been really exciting to see it come to fruition. I. I was asked to include a couple final slides. There are two more. Jennifer, so sorry to interrupt again. We can't see your slides anymore. Oh dear, I'm sorry. It was, it's only been the last one or two, I think. I just wasn't sure. Thank you for letting me know. Something happened where um, you all disappeared too. <laughs> Try again. Um, Perfect. When did it disappear? Did you see this one? Um. No, I don't think so. How about this oh, one? Yeah, we did. We just didn't see the, the one after. Yes, we saw that one. We haven't seen the one after that one. Okay, I'm sorry about that. No, no, no worries. Thank you. I, and I still can't see you. So something something happened to my Zoom that was weird. Um, but in any case, here's my email address. It's jvanoss at wisc.edu. Um, do you want me to share the slides for the upcoming presentations or should we pause for questions before I share those? No, that would be perfect. We can share those slides. Okay, so there's one here on March 8th that's coming up, and then there's also one on March 29th. So I guess I can maybe just leave it on this one for a few minutes and then I'll switch to the next one. Um, 